So uh, first of all, I'm happy to see you because I was terrified that I'm going to present to an empty room because the cloud native geospatial workshop is also overlapping this one. And I thought like, oh, if I would not give a talk, I would be definitely there. So thank you for joining. And uh, I promise uh, <laughs> that uh, my talk will have something for you. So yeah, first to establish a baseline. Yeah, uh, my name is Aaron. Uh, I'm a freelance. Uh, software developer and remote sensing uh, professional. I'm based in the Netherlands and um, I help companies create or simplify their data processing workflows. It's something that I've done yeah, since the beginning uh, uh, in my career and yeah, it is always tilted heavily towards raster data and making it kind of easier for companies to manage to, so they could have more spare time to do other things. <laughs> um, um, all right, let's dive in. So I will not be reading out parameters about the Copernicus program. This is not going to be those uh, uh, um, talks. But uh, it's, it's perhaps good to mention that, right, the Copernicus uh, uh, program is this Earth Observation Program of the EU Commission, right? It is implemented by ESA, our European Space Agency. and it is really big, but somewhere at the core of it, we have these open uh, uh, data producing Earth observation satellite missions. So you have like Sentinel-1, that is like a SAR radar satellite mission. You have Sentinel-2, that is a high resolution optical mission at 10 meter resolution. You have Sentinel-3, that is a lower res uh, resolution regional geared satellite mission aimed at ocean and land science re and research, and you have the Sentinel-5P that is geared towards air quality. And, uh, you know, if you just uh, peek at those figures, I took this screenshot yesterday night. Um, you can see how many petabytes of data is available since the launch of these satellites. These are all open data. If you add it together, it's about 80 petabytes of data as of yesterday night. And, you know, the, the takeaway from this slide is just my point is that it's a lot of data, and um, so, <laughs> and, and it's all promoted as like right. It's, it's, it's financed by public money, and it's made publicly open for in the name of open science, and everyone is encouraged to use it at home, at school, or at work. So yeah, let's use it. So you head out <laughs> to find yourself in a hot mess of data portals. And then you have this phenomenon, if you have seen in the past 10 years, that we have these things called platforms, and then we have these things of engines. Because what has been happening, uh, coincidentally, that, yeah, we launched this Copernicus program, all these satellites, but roughly just after, all these crowd providers proliferated, and you, and you had a boom in processing power, and then they realized that, wow, we have a lot more data, we have a lot more processing power, so, hey, why do we keep downloading the data when actually it's sometimes smarter that we move the processing where the data is? And uh, that gave birth to these platforms, quote, unquote, where you could yeah, log in and uh, do your little processing where the data is. So you would not have to download all these things to your desktop. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure you, you heard some of them. So... Yeah, you, you, you map out this uh, uh, universe of data portals and uh, yeah, there are some big shiny ones. I'm sure you, maybe your colleague even uh, used it and told it as, hey, that's great. You should uh, use that one. Or yeah, like, oh, I remember like the first portal is maybe some faint uh, little thingy that's not interesting anymore. So um, we can attach some names, right? So that maybe uh, help a bit. So, right, the big shiny things, some of them is definitely like Google Earth Engine. But then you also have recently another reasonably shiny thing, the Microsoft Planetary Computer, where you can travel to and do your processing to uh, uh, get your answer to the, yeah, everything. <laughs> or so does the marketing say. Plus some other oddball uh, uh, other. This is by no means I'm trying to name drop the key players and everything. This is just a good sample, I guess, of some of the more well-known um, services out there. 
Um, and then, yeah, if you look at like the right left corner, that ESA Sci-Hub, who has heard of ESA Sci-Hub before? Yeah. All right, yeah, but at least one hand I see. That's, not, not, that's the very first data portal that got uh, launched when uh, they, they, the first Sentinel uh, satellite got launched. So basically when the data started pouring in, everyone was logging in there and waiting for the first data set. And that was like, I, I remember I was, I think, almost a trainee still. I was like a junior uh, remote sensing uh, uh, specialist, a uh, young uh, person at the company. And yeah, it was very cool. Uh, and then since, all the, since then, all this, th all this other stuff came by. And then last year at my work, uh, yeah, about a year ago, I got an email from a newsletter saying that, hey, uh, we are going to decommission and destroy that ESA sci hub little faint star to make uh, uh, a space for the new thing, which is called the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem. And it's not a portal, it's not a platform, it's everything, it's all you need. It's, it's, uh, it's multiple platforms, it's a multiverse of everything. And like, I, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I uh, clicked away the email, looked out of the window, and I thought, like, man, uh, okay, it's another kind of buzzword platform with all this, and it's ecosystem, like, uh, what is going on? <laughs> and um, I thought it may be helpful, before we dive in, uh, to see what is this Copernicus data space ecosystem, to explain a bit better how uh, this evolution came about. So, if that black dot was the Big Bang, or in this case, kind of the big launch of the Sentinel-1 satellite at 2024. Then you in the beginning see that like this, this universe would be kind of like the influence of ESO and where the, all the Copernicus data lives. <laughs> then it was quite empty. Indeed, you just had this Sci-Hub data portal where you could go there, uh, click through, filter, and download your image. It was really an unfinished user interface as well. Plus, it has an API, so uh, yeah, if you could figure it out eventually, then you could uh, automate the download of these uh, single products. And then uh, fast forward just one or two years, and then this thing popped up because what happened is that Google Earth Engine was actually already pre-existing, but then yeah they created a pipeline to scoop up all the data and, and import it into their engine. So then this really gave us a very cool example of the power of what can you accomplish and how much faster when you don't download everything and do it at your own server, at your own desktop, but you log in somewhere where the data is and uh, uh, get your processing done there. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was really great. I remember everyone has been playing around with it. There was also some amazing research done also from in the Netherlands exploiting the possibilities of this engine uh, where you could just, yeah, whatever you wanted to do on a local scale, you could just run it for the whole planet. And then right after that, the next five years became really confusing. So you have what is called the Copernicus Diocese. I have to apologize, you have forgot the acronym, but you don't need the explanation, diocese. It's, uh, you, you don't need more noise. It's basically all these um, uh, platforms that are kind of similar to Google Engine or kind of like wannabes, but they are all um, supported by ESA and maybe targeting different domains. So you would have a kind of DIAS, uh, DIAS platform for, I don't know, agriculture, where you could log in and um, do what you need to do. But they, they never really took off, uh, or at least my feeling is that they never really fulfilled the promise, or maybe it, we, they just over-promised <laughs> of what they, these were. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the Sentinel Hub also came, which turns out oh, to be uh, now a key player that is a set of APIs which, uh, which also helps you to query and download and process uh, heaps of uh, this um, Copernicus data. And yeah, this era was really, really confusing. You would go to conference to figure out like, all right, now 
which of these I should go to uh, uh, get things done that I want to do. And then we go to conference, you would talk to these companies who are behind these because it was, it was uh, facilitated and, and, and pushed by ESA, but the implementers of each of these are private companies or a consortium of them. Some of them is involved in more, some of them is just in one. And uh, if you ask them, according to them, all of them is like, great, it's awesome. It is a really highly political environment and it's really hard to navigate. And then you could say that, all right, don't ask them, I'll ask the users. But then you listen to the users, ah, oh, wait, they also get paid to do use cases on their own platform. So they basically not just develop the platform, but they also the users of it. And then they will tell great stories how it is useful. But hey, if it's not my own platform and I'm missing a tool, it will not be added as fast as, right, if it was my own, then I could just ask my developers to add it and make my project a success anyway. So this was extremely uh, frustrating. And this Copernicus data space ecosystem is a reaction to that. <laughs> so uh, that huge hot center of mass there is basically a set of these dioceses and the Sentinel hub uh, components pulled together um, they create kind of landing page for it, so it explains that for what service, where do you have to go. But uh, they also uh, made a huge effort to, for example, standardize the authentication. So it's, you don't need separate accounts for any of that. It's a single account, and I think the keyword for what they used when they launched this is federation that, that, um, that they kind of get these select industry partners of theirs, and then this uh, ecosystem portal is going to be a kind of unified way to get you where to want and use standards um, um, to query or download or process the data, not a custom user of interfaces. And um, yeah, so it's also like this epoch. So I, each of them I named an epoch. And yeah, this epoch I think is like platforms along standards because what Microsoft Planetary Computer has only also became a reality in this epoch. And they also use standards like Stack. Any, anyone heard of Stack? Yeah, the Spatial uh, Temporal Asset Catalog. That that, yeah, that is younger than the Copernicus mission or the Copernicus program because, yeah, it, it sprung up from the industry for, by the demand of a need, of a, by the need to able to fastly query and uh, able to catalog all those satellite images. So, for example, yeah, um, uh, Planetary Computer uses those standards. This is an open standard. Also, with, uh, this ecosystem is also uh, uh, having this standard implemented. So um, it is, yeah, I don't know. I call it a landing page. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's basically, um, this would be the front side, and then you would get the select services. They have um, also a unified um, documentation and learning resources. So if we just get a quick inventory, the available APIs are the set of OJC API, like WMS, WFS, and et cetera. Uh, you have Stack, and you also have OpenEO. Uh, I'll explain it a bit later. That is also a universal way to like uh, um, script up a processing uh, query against the cloud backend. So uh, I'll expand on it a bit later. They have uh, this Jupyter Lab environment as well, where you could yeah uh, log in and uh, and in that environment you could create that processing recipe in a Jupyter notebook. Data for workspace, yeah, it is workspace and data is so confusing, but basically that is also an environment where you can uh, do easy processing on the data without scripting required. So you could click together the recipe, but my understanding is that that is quite basic. Um, yeah, centralized documentation, I mentioned it already, and the learning resources are also uh, uh, closely coupled. Uh, so that is actually really nice that, uh, yeah, this kind of center of mass, <laughs> what this uh, the ecosystem uh, is, has all the tools you need to get started. But yeah, this ecosystem part is also, uh, to me, is the most confusing uh, thing ever, because I, yeah, I actually went and I drilled down the documentation and 
as I said, these are all provided by partner companies who have their own soft platforms, which is kind of shadow. So um, it's, uh, it, you will, you, with the documentation, you will be funneled into their own product documentation. But anyway, uh, I thought that was like a, uh, an overview for the portal. But then you could say, hey, you know what? I can't be bothered with this. I just need one satellite image for my project, and I need that now. I would say then, no problem. Please download the Stack API browser plugin for QGIS. It's, uh, it's then really easy. So I could just uh, digitize an area of interest of mine around Bratislava. Press that plugin button. You will get this uh, window where I can select my stack backend. And yeah, you can configure here the Copernicus ecosystem, but if you really can't be bothered, like really can't be bothered, then the planetary computer stack API is already pre-configured. And this is an advantage of these standards that, hey, one doesn't work or I cannot configure, I'll just use the other one. Um, you can select uh, the collection, for example, Sentinel-2, filter by uh, time range, filter by uh, extent, or just give my polygon. You'll get the available results. These are called like the assets. I like that one. So then I can display the footprint or just go into the asset to look at the actual files. And I want the RGB, so you can browse, select the, all the contributing files of that single image. Uh, and then you can either directly load them, so it gets streamed uh, into uh, uh, raster layers, or download them as a file. And yeah, there you have it. And yeah, you will have to stack the layers to make them RGB, because these are separate now grayscale layers. Um, and yeah, I totally missed this one, but uh, I, chatted, uh, I had a chat on the social night with uh, um, Lutra and Stefanos, and he told me that, hey, you're, you know, this is actually a QGIS enhancement proposal that got accepted. So if you really, really, really cannot be bothered, then you don't even have to download the plugin, because this is coming. <laughs> so uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, in the browser, so around you should look around there. And uh, I don't have a version when it is coming, but uh, it is coming. All right, another one. I need a base map for my uh, QGIS project. Yeah, let's do it. So here um, in this one, yeah, you, you need an account at the, this Copernicus ecosystem. Yeah, it's free to create. And there you have to go into a dashboard. It's all explained in the documentation. Create a key for your uh, OGC API. And there is a configuration tool to configure the layer settings. So here you can actually create quite a lot of different uh, um, map uh, layers for your OGC uh, uh, web map service, uh, NDVI, and other kind of derived indices as well. And once you map it, then it will just pop up there as a, as a web map server. And then you will just add it. And uh, yeah, sorry, it's, uh, it would be just displayed there. Um, yeah, and then and, and if you are also wanting to hop on this kind of cloud train that, hey, I want to you know, analyze AO data in cloud at scale, but want to draw the results in QGIS anyway, then, uh, oops, then, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't like to name drop and lead people to all these commercial services, but I have to say these two are quite complete. I did not use, I tried to avoid uh, using them, especially that, Keep in mind, this is supposed to be open data, which are all paid for from public money. So why would I need to depend uh, even just for data access for some gatekeeper? But yeah, they do have additional things that make it uh, uh, valuable. But hey, there is another way. Uh, it's called OpenEO. That is an API Python, R, or JavaScript API. That it's a package, you download it, and it abstracts away the cloud backend from your processing recipe. So you can develop it in R or, um, or Python or JavaScript, and you can switch with minimal modifications from, let's say, a cloud, a Google engine uh, backend to another uh, backend. It has a Python plugin, but it does not have a maintainer at the moment. Uh, but uh, I'm helping uh, them to uh, kind of get that plugin again into shape. So you could, from directly from QGIS, you would have to configure uh, uh, the work. 
the jobs, but then you could execute them if you just and display the layers. Finally, if you just want uh, uh, white pages, then this uh, GitHub repository, the awesome Sentinel, is just a list. It's like a readme file, think of it like that, where people log all the newest and best uh, uh, Sentinel 2 resources. I invite you to check it out. And also, if you see something there that's outdated, or see something there that, uh, or see or know something that's not there, then please contribute because this is a low commitment, high impact open source contribution that you can make uh, to make other people's lives easier. And also just uh, to, as a closing note, yeah, you know, the only things constant in this cloud uh, bonanza is change. So this is not the end stop, there will be a next thing. I don't know what it is, uh, but, but I think, if you focus on these new open standards that are created in these later stages and not on these monolith and mini monster platforms, then you will be proud of, uh, better uh, future proof yourself for those changes. Thank you. No. Yeah. Um, the ASA comes uh, also with his own software to analyze all this data. Uh, could you, do you know something about this? Or do oh yeah, the ESA Snap. Yes. Yes, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> Is it? But have you ever used it? Or yeah, of course. Yeah, I used it a lot. It's just uh, yeah, I uh, don't uh, like using it. But of course, it it can be mentioned as a that it is a desktop software also to process and maybe it has specific tools that you do not have in QGIS but I would say whether you need it that really depends so I would say start with QGIS because it's great general purpose GIS system while that is a snap isn't Uh, hello, you got me <coughs> hooked up, but uh, I'm a lame user, so how much benefit in this space? I need to try it out. <laughs> how much? Pardon me, how much? How much disk space and uh, bandwidth? Oh, how much disk space and bandwidth? Yeah, uh, which one? Downloading an image? Yeah, like I am totally lame. I want to take a look at Slovakia. Then right? please download the Stack API plugin, because I have to say, I wish I had that 10 years ago. It's so easy. <laughs> It is really uh, so. The pictures will kill my machine, or is it doable on usual notebook? Yeah, it's doable. I, I can just do it on my laptop now. Uh, okay. Yeah. We have time for another question or two. Thanks, Aaron, for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, the, my question is, is around the, 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 the tools. Uh, are any of those tools going to incl include the functionality that uh, it's available in Snap uh, uh, as, as, uh, as part of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the cloud offering that uh, right now it's, uh, it's in Epoch 3? Oh, for the Copernicus data space ecosystem? Yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure. So what makes it also really confusing for me is that it's a specified select partner companies who are helping implement these services, but it's also not really mentioned on their site. And, you know, finally they moved all the archives from the old portal, but it's still, I think, documentation-wise not complete. So hopefully we'll see more information in the near future. Uh, it's definitely, things are in motion um, still. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. We, we're gonna switch to the next speaker, but let's give a warm round of applause for Aaron. Thank you.